Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus today. I am Trace, and this week we are going to have a series all about dinosaurs. I always want to say dinosaurs because of Mr. DNA from Jurassic Park, maybe you remember. We're going to talk about dinosaurs and how they were discovered for the first time, what makes something a dinosaur. We're even going to talk about cloning and economics and all sorts of really awesome stuff when it comes to dinosaurs and their fossils and how we relate to them today. Now, we have five episodes on dinosaurs. Make sure you subscribe so you get all of those episodes. You can check out a full audio podcast of this series, uncut, all five episodes, squished together over on iTunes. The link is down in the description. So, first, the discovery of dinosaurs. No one really knows, you know, like 100% when the first human discovered the first dinosaur bone, but we do know the first time that someone cataloged that they found something unusual. In the 17th century, before there was really such thing as geology and paleontology, most scientists didn't think that fossils were petrified remains of long dead organisms. They didn't really know what they were. In 1676, Robert Plott, who was a curator for an English museum, found a femur fragment that he believed was of a giant man, you know, like a big, big human. In 1677, he discussed that find in an essay he wrote, The Natural History of Oxfordshire, and all the evidence that has ever existed about that pretty much goes back to that essay, because they can't actually find the real fossil that he got. But it isn't a giant man, and he got it wrong, even though he was the curator of a museum. The plot thickens, so to speak. His name was Robert Plot. Never mind. He was the first researcher to describe and illustrate something that we would now recognize as a dinosaur fossil. And over the next hundred years, people kept discovering these things and they didn't really know what to do until at some point people put them all together and discovered that all of these weird fossils people were finding were part of the same thing. But we'll get there, don't worry, we'll get there. In 1763, Richard Brooks reviewed Plot's work and he gave the fossil fragment a name because during this time, researchers have been trying to name organisms. It was a big movement in science to try and get a specific taxonomical system, a taxonomy of all of the different things that had ever been discovered by science. There was no formal naming scheme in the mid-1700s, so the 18th century taxonomist Carl Linnaeus, a name you may remember from science class, introduced a binomial naming scheme. The idea is you take a genus, you slap a species on there, and then you get the name of that organism. So for us, for example, would be Homo sapiens. There's also Tyrannosaurus rex, the Velociraptor mongolensis. I don't know how to pronounce that one, but anyway, I'm bad at these names. But they follow this system of two names so you can specify every species. Biologists recognize the year 1758 as year zero for animal names. Any name in print on or after January 1st of 1758, that's considered A-OK. -okay. That is a valid name. Prior to that, there were names of organisms, but they're all just thrown away. We need new names for all these things that follow the Linnaeus system. Richard Brooks was the first person to apply binomial naming to what we would now recognize as a dinosaur, and he called it Scrotum humanum. Pause for laughter. Scrotum humanum. And that was Plot's fossil. And eventually, that was scratched from the record for obvious reasons in the 1990s, and they gave it a different name. In 1824, professor of geology at the University of Oxford, William Buckland, looked at fossilized remains of a partial skeleton that had been unearthed in Oxfordshire, and he named that fossil Megalosaurus. That sounds familiar. Sounds like a dinosaur. In 1825, Gideon Mantell and his wife Mary Ann named an iguanodon after discovering large teeth in England a few years earlier. Mantell went on to discover another thing that he named the Hylaeosaurus. He named that in 1833. Some historians believe Mantell was the man who was primarily responsible for discovering the branch of the tree of life that we now know as Dinosauria, but it wasn't called that yet. He kind of gets overshadowed by the next dude, because of his huge breakthrough. In late 1841, maybe early 1842, Richard Owen visited William Devonshire Saul's geological collection, and Owen figured out the iguanodon and two other large prehistoric animals were similar to each other, and unlike anything else anyone had ever encountered, Owen dubbed the new group of animals Dinosauria, 
or Terrible Lizard. And according to Professor of History of Science and Technology at Keele University in the UK, Hugh Torrens, Owen's key contribution was not just dreaming up this cool, charismatic name, Terrible Lizard, which they aren't, so Owen, come on, man. They're not even lizards. But, you know, he, it was also realizing that the Megalosaurus, the Iguanodon, and the Haleosaurus shared never-before-seen anatomical features and must be of the same type of animal. So I guess you could say that in 1842, that was when the history of dinosaur science started. And all of this stuff was happening, of course, in England. Here in America, North Americans were also finding dinosaur stuff. Dinosaur tracks were first being studied in the Connecticut Valley in the 1830s, and they were believed to belong to enormous ravens freed from Noah's Ark after the Great Flood. Because America. But paleontology wasn't really a thing back then, so they turns out they were discovering dinosaur footprints. So Othniel Marsh and Edward Cope, American discoverers, I hesitate to call them paleontologists, were working to excavate fossils in the Rocky Mountain region. And Marsh and Cope had a rivalry that has become famous among paleontological circles known as the Bone Wars, which is a really cool name. They discovered 136 new species in a very short amount of time. Their displays of their discoveries excited the world. Everybody had an appetite for dinosaurs. They were really into dinosaurs, Marsh and Cope. But they were actually more into the fame that they were getting for finding dinosaurs. So they kind of messed things up a lot. And they made dinosaurs confusing for everyone. Even to this day, we are still feeling the effects of their screw-ups, let's just say it. But we have to define what a dinosaur really is to define what those screw-ups really were. Example, flying petrosaurs, not a dinosaur. Nope. We'll get to the bottom of that though tomorrow on Test Tube Plus. What is your favorite dinosaur? We're gonna get that one right out of the way at the top. Let us know in the comments and make sure you come back here tomorrow for episode two of Dinosaurs, where we explain what a dinosaur even is. Dinosaur. I'm gonna get it out of my system. Wow.